All right, what's up, YouTube? I'm going to finish this piece. Um, I, I angled my Twitch camera so that I can actually see my drawing right now. I'm going to actually angle it that way so they can see a little better, um, which you guys can't see on YouTube because you're just seeing a screen capture on YouTube. But as you can see, I am drawing here the, uh, the final uh, shading for the um, Santa Muerte here, just adding some, a little bit of texture to the skull. And I wanted to incorporate the color red. So I'm going to do these sort of dead red roses around the head and then do some of the red makeup and like um, there's a lot of like black makeup and marks. I'm going to do this dark crimson color here. Let's see what it looks like if I do some strokes like right here. Yeah, let's let's put some strokes on the skull. This red is a little bit too saturated. We're going to desaturate it here. Yeah, here. So here we'll, we'll make some marks on the skull. Um, I don't know. I, I, I didn't really study how the makeup's supposed to look, but like Mexican designs for these, um, like the alebrijes that like you see uh, in um, like Coco, the movie Coco, um, they're like very embellished designs and I, I haven't really <laughs> done that before. So I'm, I don't want to like risk my whole, my entire thing now just trying to do that. So I'm actually going to erase this. Yeah, let's not do it on the on the cranium there. Let's do it around the eyes, because I definitely have seen it, uh, the red makeup like around the eyes. So let's get some red in there. And then let's put a maybe a red dot on the forehead. Um, they like to put hearts or maybe a flower, a little red flower in the forehead. Let's do like. You know, I, I, I did like four petals, but that, I was like, that looks too much like a cross. I suppose the five is more like pentagram-like or something. I don't want to put too much demonic imagery in here, but I don't want to like have my ideas clash. So something like that. I'm going to fade it out a little bit. I don't want these things to be too um, featured. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to feature any details of this piece. I'm just going to like totally fade it out right there. I'm going to take that crimson color again and get in there and go around the eyes maybe take a red a lighter red and go around the eyes so you can see the shadow a little bit more so I mean we're very close to done I'm just gonna do some of the some of the highlights on the skeleton here let's get on the fingers you can already tell it's a skull and again I didn't want to do too much detail on the on the Santa Muerte it's not a it's not a featured um, you know, I want people to spend more time looking at the Blessed Mother and look look down and be like, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a skull. It's death. Death is uh, being conquered. Um, now, what's interesting is that it's not Mary necessarily who defeated death. She had a role in defeating death. Um, in and because that's not what this uh, this uh, image means. This image is more about the Santa Muerte. So, it's more about uh, the Mexican imagery of this Virgen de Guadalupe is the real deal the Santa Muerte is not and she will be victorious over this image in Mexico so that's that's what this image means so I never really like thought about I mean I I, I, I need some time to kind of think about the scope of this image because this is going to be offensive to some people um, yeah it's going to be offensive to some people but but a very powerful image for for others who who believe who and agree with this image. So again, this was this was a commissioned piece, but uh, I ended up finding a lot of inspiration through this piece. Let's get that black inside the eyes here, and inside the nose, and there on the mouth. Let's give it, get some of those highlights like on the, on the teeth here. Yeah find those shadow colors okay there we go yeah nice and flattened right there we don't want the Santa Muerte to be too featured it's like super flattened and this is a very effective image I think okay so now we need the red because the Santa Muerte always has red so I'm gonna I'm gonna create a dark crimson as a base color for those little messed up rose petals so down here And if you guys are wondering about my energy level right now, 
you can see what happens if I have actually have people to interact with. I had one guest on my Twitch channel. They're actually still here listening to me right now on Twitch, I think. And it's so energizing to have the direct feedback. That's why I have these kind of long form videos with just banter. Because that's what I'm used to doing. I streamed on Twitch for like, I mean, I mean on and off, but for like, uh, what, how long? Seven years? What, what is that? Uh, tw 2016 to 2023. Yeah, about seven years. But a lot of, when I say on and off, I mean really on and off. I was not consistent with my Twitch in the later years. 2018, 2017 and 18 were the, my most active years on Twitch. Um, probably peaked in 2018 where I was getting like at least 10 to 15 viewers every stream and like 30 subs a month or something like that. So that, that was a nice time. Um, it was really slowed down since then. But I've con as a content creator, I conditioned myself to the Twitch ecosystem. I like the emotes. I like the chat. I like bantering about things. So my YouTube style has kind of kept that even though it's not that conducive to YouTube. I could stream on YouTube, but it's it's not the same. It's not the same thing. Plus the YouTube streaming on the YouTube app has given me some problems. Right now the Twitch app is uh like Streamlabs gives me some problems too, but right now the Twitch app is working really well with my 5G AT&T connection. <laughs> That's the only reason I bought that I got a new phone was to get 5G because I used to have an iPhone 11, didn't ha didn't get 5G. Um you know, get my use my little employee discount at the Apple store get my wife a new phone, take her old phone, which does get 5G, and now I have 5G internet. Unfortunately, the hotspot is still not strong enough to like support full use of the iPad. I thought it might. Now, so now I kind of regret not getting the cellular iPad, which would have been a couple hundred dollars more. Um, but that's okay. Now, these flowers are dead, right? So these rose petals, I'm going to put some highlights on them so there's a little bit more contrast at the bottom. But I don't want a saturated red. I want this desaturated kind of dead orange color. So I'm going to put some highlights on them right now so you can kind of see the flower petals a little better. And I want I want to incorporate like brown into them too. Like the Santa Muerte is, is death, right? So there's no reason why these roses should be like fully red and fully alive, right? I was considering giving the Blessed Mother a crown of flowers here to contrast from the Santa Muerte's flowers, but I thought that might be a bit much. I'm, in the Guadalupe image, she doesn't she doesn't have a crown or anything like that. She's just wearing um, the mantle or headdress. So let's inc let's find a brown to put into the dead flower color. So we're gonna get a dark crimson brown here, um, and let's kind of brush it in there. We'll let it be um, maybe the cast shadows. So yeah, we'll definitely put in some cast shadows in here. Give some depth to the. Um, flowers. It's very subtle, but, but we'll put it in. These subtleties help a lot for the overall look of the piece. That's why I've really been trying to be um, rigorous with my new process of, of painting. I think my new painting process is pretty good. I obviously have to refine it, but for me, the technique is, is showing me good results in a way that it has improved greatly from my technique before, which was just flat color. Now I'm going to finally take each of these little palettes that I made and put them in a different layer now. I'm going to cut and paste them. So here we'll cut. Whoa, let's undo that. So remove the color fill. We're going to cut and paste. So now they're on a different layer so I can remove them now. So now we're almost done. Look at that. That's almost done. And Let's see. Now we're gonna attempt to imitate the Guadalupe background. Now she has this glowing gold aura. And so I want her background to be this brownish gold similar to the, um, I forgot what the garment was called. The garment that we found the, the image on. So I'm gonna imitate this sort of brownish gold color, maybe into the orange a little bit. Let's find the right color here. Uh, the gold is a color we're thinking of. So let's remove the references now. And we just have to, it looks like, um, brush it in ourselves because, so here's the thing where Krita would have come in handy. Uh, Clip Studio Paint would have come in handy. Um, well, let's actually put this on a completely different layer here. Krita and uh, 
Pro, uh, Clip Studio would come in handy here because it will be able to detect the other um, layers. I actually don't know if you can change the color drop settings in Procreate so that it detects other layers. But if you can, I would actually prefer that because I got that's what I'm used to. So in Procreate, the color drop only detects the, sing the same layer. So if I were to color drop, the whole thing turns brown. But in Krita and Clip Studio, you can set it so that the fill tool or the paint bucket or whatever it would be called in those programs can detect this line. I would imagine that Procreate could do that, but we'll just do it manually. This was the old way for me to fill things up. This is the the um, Disney, <laughs> the uh, Walt Disney um, sweatshop kind of style of painting where you would have every single cell and every single cell would be hand-painted by an assembly line of women. Such an interesting process, which now you can color stuff like this in a single click. Right now I have to do the border and then a single click. So the, the border really had to take time. Before I figured out how to, you know, mess with paint buckets, I would um, do, do it like this. Or even with paint buckets, like imperfect paint buckets, I would have to do it this way. Okay, so this is good. Look at that. Um, I got to clean up some of the borders, some of the edges of the color here. So I'm going to take my eraser and do that. Just clean up some of those edges. I want to take my jacket off. It's, too, it's getting hot in the car. Or maybe we'll turn the AC up a little bit. It's supposed to be 67 outside. Let's crack the windows a little more. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure on YouTube you can, because I've, I've listened to my videos before. I have a hybrid um, car. And oftentimes when it gets hot, I like to keep the engine on so I can use the AC. Um, so if you're on YouTube, you can probably hear my car turning on and off. Because it, it just turns on to... Uh... Yeah, this is nice. The composition is very nice. The colors are nice. I'm, I'm actually quite proud of this piece. I'm glad I took the time. I'm glad I took the time to make this look good. Because this is, this is very rewarding to look at this. It's almost done. Um, all right, so let's do this. So we're, again, we're using the image of Guadalupe as an inspiration. So it has radiating brown lights emer uh, emanating from Mary, um, which I feel would be easier to do with paint. Um, but for mine, let's do radiating light images radiating outward from Mary. Right, let's let's try it that way. Um, so let's do it this way. Let's airbrush. Yeah, we're gonna airbrush. So we'll do the alpha lock here. Take an airbrush and find this golden yellow and just kind of airbrush around the Blessed Mother here to get that gold. Now the rose gold maybe we'll do more of a rose gold right so it looks kind of brown there but let's let's find like a pinkish glow does that look weird maybe that looks a little weird maybe the yellow is still better i'm just gonna play with it i play with the color a little bit okay yeah i'm gonna i'm just that's why we're using the airbrush we're just gonna play with it a little bit there there's a little bit of pink in this glow and then we'll take a yellow and make the glow stronger from within. So it's like a double colored um, glow here. So let's take a strong yellow and go right around the edges. So it's like a pink and yellow glow. Nice. Truly a rose gold. Oh, that that's so satisfying to look at actually. That's so satisfying. And then here we'll, um, that's almost good enough. It's just a little bit empty in the aura there. So we do have to do something. Here's what we'll do. We'll do an overlay layer so that we keep the glow. We're improvising as we go. So we're going to do an overlay layer. We'll make it a clipping mask to hook up to the um, layer beneath. We'll do an overlay layer. We'll do like a dark brownish gold. And let's brush in 
some color like that. So we get this little graphical look. Uh, you know, but it's it's a little bit too graphical if I make it an overlay, isn't it? Let's let's play with this a little bit more. Let's use our inking brush instead of our painting brush. Blow it up a little bit. So yeah, we're obviously inspired from the Guadalupe piece to make these pointy, uh, these pointy um, rays of light. Do we want it dark like that? Or do we want them light? Let's let's try with a light. Let's see what happens if I use like a light orange instead to, to lighten it. Let's see. That looks a little awkward. I don't think we should do the overlay. Let's keep it as a normal layer. Let's keep it as a normal layer so it's less graphical, it looks a little bit more painted. So let's find this orange. You know what, straight lines I think might work better. Or is that too lazy? Let's figure this out. Let's figure this out, let's find the right way. I think I have to do the spiky version of the Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah, I, I think I have to. I mean, this is this image is distinctly Mexican. I can't get away from this being Mexican. I'm not Mexican. The person who commissioned this is probably Mexican, though. And I think even though I didn't fully copy the design of the Blessed Mother, I based the colors off of her. The The overall design is based off of her. Um, the color scheme is based off of her. So to honor that, let's let's do it. Lord, you painted the Guadalupe, um, and I'm going to try to honor that design by doing the same rays of light that you did. So there are these little, little tiny sticks of light emanating outward in brown. So we're gonna do it. So this will be the last detail, I think. Whoops. And I wanna make sure I'm getting the right color here. And we're gonna use our eraser to shape them in case they look a little off. <laughs> it's very interesting doing the Guadalupe. I never, I, I, I kept telling myself, I'm not gonna do the Guadalupe, I'm not gonna do the Guadalupe, right? I'm gonna use it as inspiration. I'm not gonna make a copy of it. But here I am doing the same rays of light found in the Guadalupe image because I, I just, I couldn't get away from it. I thought, you know, I might be able to do something different, but we're, we're, we're gonna do it pretty much exactly. And this is gonna take some time. It's a lot of little spikes of light. So we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna have them coming up, coming up here. It feels very analog to do it like this because I was thinking there's got to be some way to uh, you know make make a shortcut of this right but I think that analog feeling of just hand painting every single one feels right and it makes me wonder was the image of Guadalupe done instantly within the cloak or did it happen over time, like as he was walking, that God was hand painting it? You know, it makes it really makes me think. It, it it's going to be an age old question, right? Like, how did that image come to be? How was that possible? It is masterfully crafted. You know, if if human hands did ever touch a painting, it's it's masterfully made, and it is an image that will resound through the ages. So there's some thin ones and some thin ones. Again, a very analog feel to the to the image. Some of them here are too thick. So again, I'm going to use my eraser to shape them. Make sure they're pointy. If I'm having trouble if I'm having trouble doing this with digital art, the painter must have had a nice method. 
And again, if the painter is God, of course, of course. What do you think, viewers, about the image of Guadalupe? If you are not religious and you've never heard of it, I would highly recommend checking it out. So interesting. So while we're here <laughs> on YouTube, I'm going to try to recount what I know about this about the story of Juan Diego and, and the Lady of Guadalupe. So from what I know, Juan Diego. No, there's so much to it. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to mess up the story. I know I'm not going to retell the story as if I know it. I'm going to say what I remember. I know that he had some inter interaction with like a local. Um, I don't know if he was a king or a governor or something. Um, I don't know what he was asking for. I know there was like a bishop there or something. <laughs> Such a bad retelling of the story. I don't I don't know it. What I do know is that Juan Diego went up to like a mountain. And then um, he... How did he encounter the Blessed Mother? I think he... I don't know if there was a, a smell or an aroma. But he started... Um, she asked him... I think she appeared to him and asked him to co collect flowers from the top of the mountain. And then as he was, uh, he collected the flowers, he, he held them inside of his little garment. I forgot the name of the garment. Um, but he held them inside his garment. And when he went back to the king or the, the bishop or whoever it was, um, he unloaded the garment, you know, to show them the flowers. Because I think they were supposed to be like unusual flowers that were not supposed to be found in a place like that. And then when he opened his... Uh, his clothes painted on it was the image of Guadalupe so uh, um, that's the legend it was in the 1500s you know there's like I'm open to the possibility of the story like you know being made up but like there's a lot of his historians there's a lot of scientists that are tied to the story and it seems to be the case that whenever it's researched like it, it's a it's a miraculous image right so um it's kind of awkward that the that the angle of the spikes up at the top don't match the angle of the uh, the little halo that I made. I might do an overlay in there so that the halo can be a little bit less distracted by those things. So um, I'll actually do that now. So let's figure that out. So I don't know if it's going to be overlay or if it's going to be um, normal. We'll find a color. So let's let's make this overlay. Yeah, and I think here we can sh distinctly show, hey, this is digital art. If we do an overlay layer like this. Oh, but you know what? That's okay. It doesn't have to be. No, yeah, let's do it like this. Um, put it up here. There we go. There we go. So, and I'm going to airbrush in here. I'm going to do a alpha lock on this and airbrush it so we can see. Right in there we have a halo. Now let's mess with the color of that one because it's a little bit too yellow. Might desaturate a bit. Up the brightness. Desaturate. That's nice. Look at that. Do we want a green? Ooh, that green is nice. Ooh, that's nice. Sometimes you run into some surprises. That green is very nice. That little green hue there. Hold on. I'm going to do that again though because... Wait, you know what? I can just grab this color lightly brush it in there oh you know what no that's wrong yeah let's try again so we'll do this brush it in here dang it i messed up so this has to be normal first we'll make it normal they're normal grab this color put that in there color this whole area and then turn it back into an overlay and then do the hue and saturation, move it to the right, make it a little green, up the brightness. That is a very nice effect. Desaturate a little bit. That's really nice. Lower the brightness a little bit. That's nice, I like that. Okay, so we'll go back to our spikes layer, I'm calling them spikes. And we'll continue uh, drawing them. We are really pushing the time here. How much time do we have left? We have a, um, it's 8.21. Have, this has to be done by, by I'm gonna say 9.30. So we have an hour to do these things. 
that should be just enough time. Wow, I'm gonna do this right on deadline. Like, that's kind of funny. I, cause I should, I could have done this like really quickly. Um, going in each layer, just fixing some things, making these adjustments. In the airbrush layer, there is a piece missing. So right in here, I'm just gonna fill that out. It's right there, just kind of painting that in. Right there. Right there. And then back in the spikes, take this color, make some more. La Virgen de Guadalupe, pray for us. Pray for my family. Pray for my viewers. Pray for our careers, all of our endeavors. Pray that we have the food that we need today. And again, it's interesting, right? Like as a Catholic, we can pray this way. We can pray this way. Now we're not praying that the that the power of Mary will answer this herself. I mean, we as humans, and she as a human, does not have that kind of power. But she, being in heaven, is close to the face of God and being alive in heaven can request more purely than we can from God that our prayers be granted. That's intercessory prayer. That's what we believe. So I know I know a lot of Protestants have uh, issues with that. I'm going to take this entire piece right here and lower the angle a little bit. So let's move it this way. Whoops. There, that way. Just gonna move it so that we get some more symmetrical angles. I might move all of this kind of down so that it kind of matches the other side. There, and make one here that's sort of changing angle. So in Mexico, they love intercessory prayer. They love the saints. They love La Virgen. So we are matching the spikes right now, and this is gonna be our final touch to the piece. And we can just take a relaxing pace. So, you know, um, any banter that I have left to talk about, I can just fill here. So I've had an interesting journey in the past 48 hours. Had this crazy bout of anxiety the other night. Um, faced ambiguity in my life. Um, never really know what's going to happen to me sometimes. Dealing with the consequences of a, of a life of addiction. Um, uh, in a situation where I have to be in my car a lot. And I'm not going to explain that, but it's just how it is. Um, working three jobs. Um, technically four if you include this. As a husband and a father and trying to make ends meet. And, and going back to school also trying to provide for my family, trying to just be a good person, be a good simple person, uh, really diving again deep into my faith and wanting to follow the saints, not just Mary, but also St. Joseph. I've been watching The Chosen, so a lot of changes in my life in the past year, and it's actually the perfect time to reflect on this because my birthday is next Thursday. I'm turning 35, which sounds old. <laughs> it's, you know what? 35 rounds up to 40, so that sounds old. I'm 34, almost 35. It's almost like I'm entering into the, the second half of my life, you know? Entering into my ministry in a way. <laughs> That's what it seems like. Like, spent time in the desert and entering my ministry. And how poignant that um, my past life full of a life of sin. Um, almost culminating into this piece here of having that reminder yesterday to surrender all my will and my life to God and knowing that if I do that, even here going down to the bottom of the image, we defeat sin and death. We can defeat sin and death. 
that even a regular person like Mary de can defeat death. Again, not by her own power, but by submitting to the will of God. And that's, that's, that's what makes Mary great. That's why the devil hates Mary. Now, Protestants don't hate Mary. They just don't venerate her the same way Catholics do. It's different. It's different. We don't worship Mary. Sometimes it can feel that way, right? And I'm sure there are some people who might take it that way, and then that would be uh, a heresy, right? To worship Mary. But I think I, I, when, when I read the 33-day consecration of Mary, like you can think of it this way. You cannot possibly love more, Mary more than Jesus did. You, it's not possible. <laughs> I mean, she, he was, um, as far as we know, her only son. Um, so it's like, if we, if we think about intercessory prayer, if we just think about it for a second, and, you know, th even, even if you don't believe in God and, and you think this is all m superstition mumbo jumbo, but just think about it for a second. If God is real... If God is Jesus, which Christians believe, and if he's listening to our prayers, if, and if you believe that Mary is alive in heaven, if you believe that, that Jesus is with his mom in heaven, then we can easily conclude that he would listen to her and love and adore her as mom in a same or even even more beautiful, joyful way than he would have. Well, let me make sure the alpha log is here. In 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 his earthly life, and in the chosen. Not to spoil anything, I know one of my viewers here might might um, be spoiled by this, but there was a uh, yeah. I'm not going to say what happened, but there was a moment in the chosen, and pretty much. In the Bible, you, you can really see this moment in the Bible where Mary tells Jesus to do something and he listens because she is mom. And it's like, it's so well done in the show. I'm like, oh my God. And it made me wonder if the show maker was Catholic and he's not. That really surprised me because that was such a Catholic moment where Mary told Jesus to do something and he listened because she is mom. And that's what, that's why the main reason why Catholics hold Mary in the highest regard that she is the greatest of saints because she was the closest to Jesus. She gave birth to Jesus. Um, hold on, just making some corrections here. The forehead could be smoothed out a little bit, so I'm going to take that airbrush and just kind of smudge and smooth this part. Maybe take the smudge tool a little bit. No, oh, too big. Smudge this part a little bit. Clean up that face. Okay, back to the spikes. But that's the idea. That's the idea. She basically, son, they need your help. Can you do this? So here's the thing. This is, a, and we we can go into deep theology about this too. We can we can talk about the deeper theology. If God is perfect, He doesn't have any need of anything. He's complete. So why should we even exist at all? Because His His existence is love. The the act of creation, the act of His existence itself that we exist is an act of love because we didn't have to exist. So uh, so we can look at it that way theologically, right? Um, so why would he answer prayers? And if we characterize it like a, a loving father, that's how he's often characterized, like a parent who wants the best for his children. And yet, you know, if my son, because I have, I have kids, I have a son who's growing up pretty fast. He's almost, he's going to be turning one and a half soon. And when he's talking, if, if he asks me for something, I'm going to listen. And I will have to tell him, hey, uh, yeah, you can have this. Or no, you can't have that. And if he really, really wants something, he really, really wants something. If I know it's good for him, I'll be like, yeah, I will. I will heed that request. Now, if we think of God, it's like, okay, he, he should know our requests already. But the act of asking is a point of connection. It's a relationship. So if my son didn't ask, let's say I already know he wants that. 
but I'm not going to give it to him until he asks. Like, why, why would I, why would I do that? It's because I want to build that connection. I want him to be open to me. I might hint to him, hey, um, let me know if, if there's anything you want. I want to have that connection. So why have the connection? Again, that's out of love. Now, love is um, the act of giving. It's selfless. But there's a type of love, eros, that desires unity also. So love is, is connecting, it's giving, and it's also unifying. It's part of the nature of love. Now, I'm, I, it, I, it's hard for me to talk. I can't talk about this from first principles because we'd have to go through a full course of Aquinas and, and just read the Summa Theological, which I plan on reading. But um, to anyone who's listening to this and doesn't believe in God, it's just going to sound like woo-woo mumbo-jumbo stuff. But I'm just trying to see the logic of like intercessory prayer right now. I'm just trying to explain that. Now, let's think about it this way. If my wife asks me something. Now, um, Mary, in a way, was the spouse of God. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and conceived uh, of the Holy Spirit. But her earthly spouse was Joseph. Now, the tradition says they were both celibate. I don't really know. Um, was Mary a virgin her whole life? Uh, was Joseph a virgin her whole life? I mean, th the tradition like strongly states that Mary was, but is not conclusive on, on Joseph's. Um, and it's, I think it's good that they're not conclusive about it because uh, um, there's no evidence to say that otherwise. The, we don't even know if Mary was his first wife. Like, we, you know, we don't know that. Some people say he could have been old. Some people say he could have been like had, he could have been a widower. Um, like we, there's, we just know nothing about him. We know enough to know that he was a great saint. So while finishing on Mary, I could talk about Joseph a little bit. San Jose. St. Joseph, one of uh, my favorite saint lately. The power of St. Joseph. I, I made a video about this. Why is he great? He did, he, he did his job. What was his job? As the husband of Mary and the father of Jesus, he protected them. He worked for them. Um, protecting, protecting is huge. Like he pre protected them from Herod Antipas killing the firstborn of Bethlehem. He protected Jesus from that. If not for that, I mean, uh, you know, it, it was... I'm not gonna say if not for that we wouldn't have had salvation because God would have found a way, but God decided that that would be the case that He would come um, as a baby, helpless baby, come in dependence of us. You know, at first, um, my favorite song right now, "In Christ Alone." The second verse goes, "In Christ Alone, um, He took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe." That's the line: "Fullness of God and helpless babe," like. The story of Christmas, that's God in the manger. There's Mary and Joseph protecting him, taking care of him, feeding him. And if you if you ever if you ever had a baby, there's a there's a whole process to that. Changing his diaper, like changing his poop out. I don't know what they use back then for diapers. I don't know if they use cloth or if they just dispose of it, if they use leaves. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I never try to underestimate the technology of you know, they obviously had boats and metal back then, so I don't want to underestimate the technology of 2,000 years ago. Um, but they had to do that. Jesus pooped. He ate. He, I'm not sure. Maybe he probably breastfed. Um, he needed little baby clothes. It was Joseph making those. Was Mary making those? I don't know. But we can only imagine. And that's what I love about right now. And it's, it's beautiful that as I'm finishing this painting... And I'm about to go to the church called Holy Family Parish. My devotion lately has is not just Mary, not just Joseph, not just Jesus, but the naturalistic image of the Holy Trinity, which is the Holy Family, La Sagrada Familia, Le Sainte Famille, La Sainte Famille, is it La Famille? Three languages, the Holy Family. I want to learn how to say holy family in every language. But a beautiful, beautiful image of these three people, three arguably the most important people that ever lived, 
a humble, poor Jewish family that absolutely completely changed the world with their obedience, humble obedience to the will of God. And so if we think about it that way, for me right now, I'm not rich. I have a wife and kids. Um, I'm coming from a life of sin. Now, they that, the case is different with them. They, they did not come from a life of sin. As far as we know, Mary and Jesus were sinless and Joseph was righteous. I'm coming from a life of, life of sin. I'm trying to be righteous. My life is going to look different from theirs. But here's the idea. There are plenty of saints that were sinners. And it's all about just humble surrender to the will of God. Whatever that means for you, whatever that looks like, that's the idea. So with that said, perfect timing as I'm finishing this um, painting, coming from a night of anxiety to a 48-hour experience, well, more like 36 hours, to this uh, conclusion of the piece, which looks great. That looks great. I think um, this little circle the piece, though, can be a little bit more opaque. I might duplicate it. Let's duplicate this. And we'll make, maybe make this one a, a normal layer. We'll make this one normal but less opaque. Just so that we cover those pieces a little bit. That the light kind of obscures the light from coming from behind her. The halo in her head. And then we'll change the color of this a bit. So we'll change the hue to maybe this yellower thing. Change the brightness. Saturate a little bit. We want it to be yellow. We don't want it to be too white yellow here. So let's take a look at that now. Yeah, that's a little bit stronger. So I think that's it. That's finally done, folks. I think that that's a great image. Again, it's not the Lady of Guadalupe. It's like based on her. It's not perfect. The imperfections make it look analog. It's clearly digital. So it looks modern. The face is very anime. Um, and we got the skeleton down there, the Santa Muerte. I think I'm very satisfied with this piece. So with that, um, I'm gonna call it done. I'm gonna send it over. Here, I'll, here's, here's what I'll do. I'll take the whole thing, put it in a, a, a group, and expand the image a little bit. So here's what I'll do. Every visible layer here, I'll group them. Put it in this group here. Here, let's start with this bottom one, actually. Move this one here. Just moving our layers around. There we go. So now I'm gonna make, um, I'm gonna take the group and expand it uniformly so that it fits into a print pretty well. Not if, try not to affect the composition, trying to keep things centered. It's not even perfectly centered, like, <laughs> as I wrap around it. Well, actually, no, it might be. It's just that the the stick of the scythe is more on the right. So it's still it's still a balanced composition. Um, but there we go. That's done. So I'm going to save this in two versions. I'm going to save it with a white background, and I'm going to save it with a transparent background. So let's save this. Share. Save uh, as PNG. Uh, save image. And then we will... Remove the background. We will save image as PNG also. Save image. And that's it. Oh, that's the conclusion of this piece. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, it's, it's been very satisfying to do this piece. It took too long, but we had a very satisfying image. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can sell a copy of this. I'll put it up on my online store. Finally get to make another Instagram post. So very, very exciting. I'm gonna make a time lapse. We can get a lot of content out of this. So we're gonna stretch this one. Um, again, thank you guys for joining me. God bless you all. See you later. Bye-bye.